mics are off. Okay, good afternoon again, everybody, and welcome again to another of the Wednesday afternoon doctoral academy talks. Just some housekeeping, please make sure that your videos are off for bandwidth purposes and that your mics are off so that we don't hear any background sounds. So today, what I'm going to present for you is a very, very basic talk on the variables that you use to answer your research questions. So when we set up our data collection sheet, we have a whole lot of variables. And I'll go into um, which how to collect various variables. Remember, Prof Heft has spoken over the last couple of weeks about what to do with your variables for statistics, but I'm going to go right back to before where he picks up, where we look at the variables, we look at how we describe the various variables. How do we describe sex? How do we describe race, etc.? We'll also look at what's the difference between a dependent and an independent variable. It's, that can be very confusing for many people. So we're going to go right back. And then we're going to look at once you've got your variables and you've decided what kind of variables they are, you've described those variables, you've looked in your analysis to see if they are normally distributed or if they're skewed, you've identified your dependent from your independent variables. Then we're going to look at what, what kinds of tests will you want to do if you want to see if something depends on something? So we'll go into that. The important thing for you to know for yourselves before you go to the next statistician is that there are different kinds of variables that are described differently. And when you are looking at working with different variables in inferential statistics, you're going to have different tests for the different kinds of variables. So I hope that it's simple enough. Once you've gone through this talk, which I've recorded in case we had load shedding and I had to give my talk to somebody else to deliver, I'm going to go through an example of what I think people should be doing when they design their protocols. It's not something that needs to go into the protocol, but it will be a way of thinking about how you are eventually going to work with your protocols. So after the, the um, talk, which goes on for about 25 minutes, I will go into this page that I think you should create for each and every one of your projects. And then we can have a general discussion about where to go from here. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, Let me just close that. Please bear with me. My computer changed the way it presents things. Um, are you able to see my screen? It says more basic than basic statistics. Not yet. Okay, then we just make sure that I am sharing screen. It says share screen and I need to share sound as well. Um, Okay. I, you can now probably see the, the start of the Zoom meeting. Yes, we can see that. It's coming up. Okay. So let me get to here. Can you see this, the start of the um, slideshow? No, it's still not. Yes, now it's showing. Okay. Good, so I'm going to just start it. It's going to run. It's going to take about 25 to 30 minutes and then we'll come back together and I'm going to go through what I think you should be doing as you prepare for your research. Good afternoon and welcome to our talk on understanding variables for basic statistics. 
you will be required to provide some detail in your protocol on how you plan to analyze your data. The data analysis plan does not have to be cast in stone at this stage unless you're conducting a clinical trial. It can usually evolve during the analysis phase of your study. However, the analysis planning stage is essential because it makes you think ahead and helps you ensure that your objectives are achievable using the type of data you plan to collect. If you have no statistics training yet, you will need to attend a basic statistics course and have access to basic statistics textbooks and online resources. Once you have some basic competencies, you'll be able to carry out many of the tests yourself but it is essential that you have your plan checked by a statistician and have them run the more complex I think something's gone wrong with the sound. Remember that you will need to interpret the results of the statistical analysis in order to write up your results in discussion sections. A statistician can guide you in the process or collaborate with you in the study if your data requires more complex analysis. Before you start planning your data analysis, it is important to be familiar with the key concepts that we're going to describe in this talk. These are the scales of measurement, normal and non-normal distribution, independent or paired groups, and independent or dependent variables. Sometimes researchers have not, not yet developed an understanding of the language of statistics and the term a variable can be quite confusing. So let us just explain what a variable is. A variable is something that we note down to either describe the characteristics of a sample or population or it's something we measure in order to answer our research question. So let's have a look at an example here. If our research question is, how diagnostically accurate is B2M in detecting peripheral arterial disease in patients who have diabetes and various degrees of renal function, we will measure at least the following variables to answer this question. The B2M, the toe blood pressure index, and the estimated glomerular filtration rate. When we describe the participants of our study, we are going to note down the following variables, their sex, age, race, whether it's type 1 or type 2 diabetes. In our clinical studies, much of the demographic data looks like this particular data collection sheet. We'd be looking at age, sex, race, marital status, number of children, employment, level of education, total monthly household income depending, of course, on what your research is about. What I'd like you to notice here is that some of these variables give you two options. Some of them give you more. Some of them, the options mean something. And in others, the, what's required is a mere number. So we saw the differences in the last slide on what the variables could look like. So we're going to get into key concept one, the scales of measurement. The type of variable influences the type of statistical analysis that we're going to apply later on in our study. So the first thing we look at when we look at the data is we look at what, var what variables are numerical and which ones are categorical. Now it's easy to remember the difference. Numerical is number. So we're going to be representing things as numbers in numerical data. So things like count of people or a patient's height. Categorical data is you've got categories, you're putting things into boxes. And these things are things like HIV positive or negative, marital status or severity of disease. So when we go to our data collection sheet, we can see that we've got three numerical variables and the rest are actually categorical variables. We are given the categories, male or female, yes or no. For the numbers, we've just got space. We want to know the age in years, we want to know the number of children, and we want to know the, the number of rands that is earned in that household for that particular month. 
Numerical variables are again divided into two different kinds. Remember the numerical variables are the counts, things like the count of the number of people, patient's height, etc. The two different kinds of numerical variables are discrete, and this is where the value can only take on a whole number. For example, the number of patients in a ward. The other one is continuous variable. And here the measurement can take on any value. So it'll take on whole numbers and anything in between. So we've got fractions as well. So in our sheet, we have got two variables that can only be represented in whole numbers. So they are discrete variables. And then total monthly income can be anything. It can be rands and it can be cents. Our categorical variables are also subdivided into different kinds of variables. We've got the binary variables and binary like bicycle means that you've got only two options. It's either HIV positive or HIV negative, dead or alive, smoker or non-smoker. Then we get those categories that are just a name and there is no order to them. For example, marital status, gender, or ethnic group. And then lastly, you've got categories, but there's some sort of order in the categories. For example, with severity of disease, we've got mild, moderate, or severe disease. In socioeconomic status, there can be categories of annual income as well. So our data collection sheet has all three of these kinds of categorical data. The male and female and yes and no are clearly binary. The race and marital status is nominal, but the level of education from no schooling to attended college or university is definitely ordinal. There is some sort of order in those different categories. The way we summarize our data is different for categorical and numerical data. When we've got categorical data, we're going to count the number of observations in each category. We'll then calculate the percentage and give us a relative frequency for each category. And if there are several categories, we'll create a bar chart. Always make sure that the numbers in the categories add up to your sample size. So our summary statistics for sex, if we've got 100 people in our sample, we can say 50% were male. It stands to reason the other 50% were female. When it comes to race in the same sample, we can say 80% were black, 1% were colored, 12% were Indian, and 3% were white. For marital status, we can say 45% were married, etc. For level of education, we will create a bar chart. And as you can see, there are spaces between the bars to show that this is not any data that actually is linked to the next bar. It's always very good practice to create a summary table after you have designed your data collection sheet. This will help you down the road when you're doing your statistical analysis. In fact, I'd like to suggest that you keep this on one of the pages of your Excel sheet to refer to all the time. So in our case, we have age was definitely numerical, discrete. Sex was binary. It could end up being categori categorical if we added any other options from the LGBTQ or prefer not to answer options. Race was categorical or nominal, marital status also categorical nominal, number of children numerical discrete, employment was binary, level of ed education was ordinal, and the total household income was again numerical and it was continuous. It's important to note that the way data is recorded could mean that the same variable might be different in different studies. For example, age could also be categorical ordinal if the data is taken down in age groups rather than in precise age and years. If marital status is represented as yes or no, it will become binary. 
and total monthly income could be categorical ordinal if the data is requested in the form of income brackets. Another thing to note is I've been to workshops where the word continuous is used in the place of numerical and discrete is used instead of categorical. So how do we summarize numerical, numerical data? And here we go on to key concept two, which is the normal and the non-normal distribution. We look for measures of central tendencies. In a normal distribution, as the one we see at the top here, you can see that we have a bell curve. This is where there is an even distribution of people across a range. Where this does not occur, where we have more people towards the smaller measures or more people towards the larger measures, we get a skewed distribution. If it is on, if the tail is on the right, then we have a positive skew. If the tail is on the left, it is a negative skew. So we have a non-normal and a normal distribution. In the normal distribution, our mean and the mode and the median all occur at the same point. However, in your non-normal distributions, your mode, median and mean will occur at different points. And this is very important when we come to look at statistical tests. We also have to look at the way the data is dispersed around the mean. We have to look at the range of the data, which is the amount from the smallest to the largest value. And we look at the interquartile range, which is where 25% occur all the time. And then we look at the standard deviation, which is a calculation that we'll go into just now that shows the amount of variation around the mean squared from the variance. For a good refresher on how to calculate variance, mean, median, mode, standard deviation, etc., please copy and paste this link into your search engine. It's a short video that will give you, remind you about all how to calculate all of these for yourself to do your own descriptive statistics. The symmetry of data can be detected in histograms, such as the one we see here, showing birth weight, or box plots that we see over here. And in this particular diagram, you can see how there is a similarity between the box plot and a curve. To show how we get from a histogram to a normal curve, here we have the histogram. And here we can take the averages of each of those bars and create a frequency polygon. And then you can remove the bars and there you have your normal curve. As I showed you earlier, the box whisker plot can be seen to be derived from a curve. And these are pretty useful because they can show, give you quite a bit of information. It gives you your interquartile range. It gives you your median, maximum, minimum, and it also shows you where the outliers are. Very often you can see a graph where there are several box whisker plots. So in this experiment, several people were asked how many hours of sleep they got each night for a week. So on Monday, we saw that people got quite a few number of hours. Friday, they slept very well. Saturday, less so. And on Sunday, it was okay. The night that most people did not get to sleep very well was clearly a Thursday. And there were some outliers. We had some people who overslept on Sunday and Tuesday. And on Thursday, there was somebody who got hardly any sleep at all. Let us move on to key concept number three, where we're going to be comparing paired or independent groups. And this is where we'll be testing a hypothesis. There is clearly a comparison. If you're going to compare a variable in a single group or between groups, 
you need to be clear in your procedure in order to select the correct statistical analysis. In a paired group, you will be looking at one group of patients and comparing readings in those patients over time. So you will choose a within participants data analysis design. So one group of patients come in, you take a reading before they get an intervention, and then after they get the, an intervention. You're not comparing them to another group, you're comparing a before and an after. If you're going to be looking at two different groups of participants and taking a single measurement and comparing the groups, you will use a between participants data analysis design. In this case, you're likely to have a control group. If you're looking at two different groups and taking the same repeated measurements, you have to consider within and between study designs. Now let's look at our fourth key concept, the difference between an independent and a dependent variable. And I always find it easiest to explain on this sentence. How cold the Coke is depends on the temperature of the fridge. The dependent variable, the coldness of the Coke, is the outcome. The independent variable, the temperature of the fridge, is the exposure or the risk factor. Confounders are associated with independent variables. And in our Coke example, let's have a look at how long the Coke has been in the fridge or how warm the Coke was before it was put, first put into the fridge as potential confounders. Now that we understand the four essential key concepts, I'm going to provide you with a tool that will help you some way in determining what statistical analyses you will be able to use in your test. This tool will help you think about your approach to stats in your study, but remember that statisticians cannot be replaced. They have entire careers based on looking at the correct stats to answer research questions. What is important for this, with this tool is that you will be able to better understand where your statistician is coming from. Where we're going to be doing a purely descriptive study where we are not doing any hypothesis testing and our variable is categorical, we are going to merely present the data in frequencies, relatively, relative frequencies, confidence intervals and bar charts. If our variable is numerical and normally distributed, we'll give the mean, standard deviation, range, confidence interval, error bar chart, or a histogram. However, if the variable is non-normally distributed, then we'll give it the median, the interquartile range, a range, and a box whisker plot. If we're going to be testing our hypothesis, but we are not comparing groups, and if we are not looking at relationships between quantitative variables, then we'll do a cluster analysis or a factor analysis. But if we are looking at relationships between quantitative variables that are normally distributed, we'll look at a Pearson's correlation or linear regressions. If, however, they are non-normally distributed, we would use a Spearman's correlation. If we are testing a hypothesis, and are comparing groups, and the groups are paired, and there are two paired groups, and the dependent variable is categorical and binary, we would use a McNeemar's chi-square test. If it's an ordinal um, variable, then we'd use the McNeemar Bowker chi-square. If, however, the dependent variable is numerical and normally distributed, we'd use a P paired t-test, and if it's non-normally distributed, we'd use the Wilcoxon signed ranks test. If we have more than two groups in our hypothesis test and the dependent variable is categorical, then we could use the Poisson regression, a generalized linear model for binomial family or generalized estimating equation. If the dependent variable is numerical and normally distributed, we'd use repeated measures ANOVA or generalized linear models. 
and if it's not normally distributed, a Friedman test or a survival analysis. If we are testing a hypothesis and you're comparing groups and the groups are independent, you will have to list the nature of the variables according to their scales of measurement. As I mentioned, we should be have done very early on in our, our protocol, as well as if they are dependent or independent variables. So once you've listed our independent variables, if they're categorical and binary, let's call them one, categorical nominal, two, numerical normally distributed, three, and numerical non-normally distributed, we give them the digit four. If your dependent variable is categorical and binary, let's give it A. If it's nominal, B. If it's numerical and normal, C, numerical and non-normal, D. And let's see what we're going to do with those. Put them. So let's combine the independent and the dependent variable allocations and we get everything from 1A through to 4D. And these are the kinds of tests that you would be using. I hope that this talk has given you some confidence in knowing that you can understand statistics, that you are able to have a conversation with a statistician and that you'll be able to write up your results and discussion with confidence in your statistics. Now you will go and find a beginner's course in statistics and you will know the difference about when an ANOVA is used, when a t-test is used, when a Spearman's is used, etc. I'm now open for questions. Thank you very much for attending. Okay, um, what I would like to do now is share with you a hypothetical research question. Um, so I'm going to open a, an Excel sheet. So please bear with me when, as I reshare. Um, okay. So the hypothetical, can, can you all see this Excel sheet? Yes, Prof, we may see it, we see this, yeah. Okay, so this is the hypothetical research we're going to do. We're going to go to Coxstad, and we are going to look at hearing loss in that community. So we assume that we're going to make an assumption for our hypothetical test here. We're going to make the assumption that E.G. Usher has got a, a hearing loss clinic and they have outreach to schools, et cetera, to do community hearing loss tests. This is all hypothetical. So the things we're going to do is from this clinic and this cl the clinic's records, we're going to want to describe the population that's at that clinic. We are going to want to look at a family history of hearing loss. Were there any ear infections? Is there a history of ear infections? Did they take any autotoxic auto therapeutics? And what is the degree of hearing loss? Now, I see Lafunda is in um, the audience here. So please, Lafunda, you can chip in because this is very hypothetical. So yes, Prof. when we are setting up our data collection sheet, we know we are going to ask the sex, the age, the race. That is to describe things. If, is there anything else that's relevant? I mean, household income is unlikely to be relevant. HIV status, unlikely to be relevant. Several other things that you'd use to describe this um, cohort would, are likely to be in this, um, irrelevant. One of the causes of hearing loss can be genetics. So we want to see if there is some sort of family history. And in our questions, we're going to ask, is there any family history? And that's going to be a yes or no. If it's yes, we want to know how many people in the family were affected. And if so, who? Because we want to know if there are siblings, that's going to indicate one thing. If it's all along one side of the family, if it's maternal or paternal, that is going to give us an idea of what's going on, etc. So we still haven't designed our sheet yet. 
we're still thinking about the data that we are going to collect. If we've got looking at a history of ear infections, again, did you have an ear infection? Yes or no? If you did have an ear infection, when was it? And again, we think further, how many times did you have an ear infection? Was it chronic? Did you have an ear infection every year, etc.? Autotoxic um, therapeutics, and how are you going to ask this question? So you want to know, is it a yes or a no? Um, how are you going to ask this question? Um, what were the drugs? A lot of TB drugs can cause hearing loss. What were the drugs that were taken that caused hearing loss? And if so, when? And then we're looking at the degree of hearing loss. We've got the right ear, we've got the left ear, and we've got if the hearing loss has occurred in both ears. Lafunda, is this a reasonable start to thinking about describing hearing loss in a community? Uh, yes, it is, Prof. Um, just on the history of hearing loss, there's, there's, there's normally an age attached. 50 years is sort of the cutoff point, whether you lost your hearing before 50, because after 50, um, anybody can lose their hearing. Okay, so I'm going so to think, get, I'm going yeah. to add uh, another um, under description. Oh gosh, something's gone funny here. Um, age, age when hearing loss occurred. Okay. So now what I want to do is I've, I've more or less got an idea of the things that I'm going to be asking um, my participants. So let's just think about how are we going to, now this is not going to work. How are we going to ask these questions? So sex, we can ask as male or female. Okay, we can also ask as, a lot of things are happening now. We can go male, female, prefer not to answer. Um, there's the whole other thing. If it, Depending on your research question, if you want to go into the whole um, LGBTQ, if, if that's relevant, you can go into that. But I think for hearing loss, male and female is quite adequate. Your age, as Prof Hift and I kept saying, your age you can give in years. And in fact, if you're going to be keeping a long study going, something that's going to go on for 20 years, et cetera, it's probably better to get the date of birth because then you can always work out the age at whichever time you're wanting to do a cross-sectional study on that same group. So, but for this, for the purposes of this study, where I just want to go in and find out what is the problem with hearing loss in the E.G. Usher um, catchment area, years is quite adequate. Um, let's go on to looking at the races. We've got the black, white, Indian colored or other. Oh, I don't know how this is messing me around. And age when hearing loss is going to be a number. Okay. So when it comes to family history, we've got a yes or no. Um, that is a binary um, response. If so, what is the number? How many people in your family have had hearing loss? And then if so, who? And here we're going to have to think very carefully when we expand our questionnaire. We're going to have to ask specifics. Like, is it your siblings? How many siblings? Was it a parent? Are they aunts and uncles, grandparents? We're going to have to give some thought into how you are going to ask that question. Because if siblings have a hearing loss problem, but the parents don't, and there hasn't been any history of that in two or three generations, it's very likely that we've got a recessive disorder that's occurred, that's coming together in the children. If it's happening along one side of the family, it's very likely that it could be either a sex-linked um, disorder. I don't think there are any sex-linked deafness disorders, but it could also be that there's an autosomal dominant that's coming through in the family. 
So we're going to have to think very carefully how we are going to ask who the people are in the family who show hearing loss. The history of ear infection, it's a yes or no, that's easy. Then we're going to have to think very carefully about how are we going to ask when they had ear infections. If I had to ask you in the audience, when did you have an ear infection? Are you going to remember exactly when? Are you going to remember how often? Do we want to just ask, have you had an ear infection in the last um, two years? Or did you have any ear infections before you noted that you had hearing loss? Or did you often have hearing um, ear, ear infections? We're going to have to think seriously about how we're going to ask those, get, gain that da data for your study. Then autotoxic therapeutics. It's how do you ask a patient, when did you have an autotoxic medication? And they don't know. Uh, no patient knows which particular drugs can be autotoxic. So you're going to have to think how you are going to um, ask this question. Are you going to take some known drugs that cause autotoxicity and list them and then ask the patients if they've ever been given those drugs and just hope that they do remember? Or will you ask them things like, have they been treated for TB? And lead them into telling you what medications they took so that you can see if there were any autotoxic uh, medications in there. And then, of course, I have just put um, the degree of hearing loss as, as mild to mild, moderate to moderate, moderate, severe and severe. So that is done by looking at a 500 hertz test. I think I wrote down here a, a pure tone audiometry screening test. You've got 500 hertz, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, up to 8,000. Am I right there, Lufunda? Yes, you are prof. Actually, there's a WHO classification you can use. So you can either use that or just mention the degree of hearing loss. And then later on, when you are analyzing, then you categorize them as such. So yeah, oh, yeah, okay. you're actually right. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Then the next thing that I think is important for us to do is we go back to that first step that I said that we should um, look at and decide what kind of variable we are sitting with. Are we sitting with a numerical variable or a categorical variable? If they are numerical, are they um, um, discrete? Um, are they continuous, etc.? So it's sex, if we take it as male or female, clearly it's categorically, categorical and it's binary. Your age, we're going to be taking the age in years. We're not going to be saying you're 77 and a half. Whereas with pediatric testing, you might be um, looking at months. Um, so you might look at, if you're looking at uh, up to 12 years of age, you might look at um, 18 months old or seven and a half or 12. But for, for the majority of adult studies, you would stick to your nominal and discrete. So they would give you the age that they are at that moment. The race um, is um, categorical. It's nominal because there's no order to it. Um, age at hearing loss, again, that is a, that's going to be a um, numerical and discrete. It's a number again. And so we go through the saying, all the yes and no's, they are categorical binary. If so, the number of people, that's numerical discrete. And so we go through all of these things. And here I've got dates. What do we do with dates? If you tell me that you had an infection in 2017, what do I do with that? How am I going to actually get that data? I could just take that date. And at a later point when I'm analyzing my data, convert those dates into time. So if somebody says they had a, an ear, ear infection in 2017 and they're coming to you and only now with, with hearing loss, 
then you know that there's been a five year gap and you can convert that data later. But it's very often easier to get a date so that you can make a more accurate inference with your um, data a bit later. Right, then the next thing that we're going to do is, so we still haven't, sorry, we haven't even started up the true design of our um, data collection sheet yet. We're still thinking about the data, what we are going to be doing it, what kind of stats are important. So when it comes to summarizing the data, we know that what we're going to do with the categorical binaries, et cetera. Um, and we're going to have a look to see after the next step, which is whether they are normal or non-normal, we are going to have a look at how we're going to describe other things here. Um, what have I got in there? Yeah. Right, and then our last step that we're going to do is we can go back right now and decide, we can know what's going to be dependent and independent. So the kinds of questions we can ask, because our, our, our um, study is about hearing loss, we're going to want to know what causes maybe what is related to hearing loss. And going back to the Coke sentence, the temperature of the Coke depends on the temperature of the fridge or how long it's been in the fridge, et cetera. We want to know, is the hearing loss dependent on having had taken autotoxic, autotoxic drugs? So the deafness is dependent on the independent variable autotoxic autotoxic therapeutics. Does hearing loss depend on ear infections, whether those ear infections are chronic, whether the ear infections were recent, whether the ear infections were untreated? It's another question must ask. If you had an ear infection, did you, did you have treatment? Is the um, deafness or the hearing loss dependent on family history? Could it be that slightly different question? We might have to do some genetic testing. But the other things we can look at, the one that's important is age. Is hearing loss dependent on age? And age is an independent variable here. So I haven't completed this um, table. I have just populated it with thoughts, because I only thought of doing this for you at about half past one this afternoon. And I made all of this up. But can you see that if you are going to be looking at your research questions, where you are going to be doing your study, and then taking those concepts, those key concepts that are in the talk that we I presented to you earlier, you can get a really good picture of what your data collection sheet could look like, how you're going to collect your data, so you're not going to make the same kinds of mistakes as just thumb sucking, getting a group around a table to say, hey, let's just work on this. And you can also start seeing what kind of test you're going to do. So hearing loss and age, I think I looked up is a crystal Wallace test. So you can, you can have a look and see if you think it's a crystal Wallace test, but you go to the statistician. And if he comes up saying it's a T test, you know what a T test is. And you can say, really? Can you explain to me why you are using a t-test when maybe a Criscoll Wallace would work? So that tool that I gave you at the end of that talk is there only for your understanding and for, for you to, to get a picture of where your data can, can be used in statistics that will make sense. So that is what I have to present to you today. Um, this clearly is the most basic of basics. It's enough to just get you to describe your statistics and to, for you to understand what to do. And I sincerely believe that creating this kind of table here with any research question will help you to make sure that you are going to think about how you ask your questions 
think about how you're going to gather the data and think about how you're going to present the data and analyze it. So now I am open to questions. Lafunda will answer any ENT questions and Prof Heft will answer any more um, statistics questions that are um, a little more advanced. So opening the floor to discussion. Okay, Lafunda, if I can ask you why other people start thinking about questions. I mean, I, I, the only knowledge I have of ENT is through you because we are working together in your research. And I was able to just thumb suck an idea because I know where um, E.G. Usher is. I know it's in Coxstad. And I was going to bring up the point that Coxstad, E.G. Usher, a lot of people make an assumption that if you go to Nguilazana Hospital, you're going to be seeing mostly Zulu patients. If you go to E.G. Usher, E.G. Usher sees a lot of patients coming from the trans guy as well as KZN. So they are going to be a mixed African group. Um, but the, the, the point I want to ask you here is having made this up, can you see that there is some merit? In, so I am a complete novice in terms of a deafness study. Does it make sense? I'm actually, uh, I think it's a brilliant example, very relevant. There's a lot to think about actually when, uh, when doing this. Uh, you've done a brilliant job. In fact, yeah. uh, there's, there's, there's certain things, for example, history of autotoxic medications. Often they're not going to know what that is. And what we then try to do is probably ask it in another way. For example, um, the children who are admitted in ICU receive a lot of this medication. So another way to ask is, have you had an ICU admission for any severe illness? And if they say no, uh, that will probably give you, probably didn't receive these things. Another way is what you said. Have you been treated for TB? Have you been treated for cancer? Have you had head and neck radiation? All those things. So you can put them as individual things. But when you put them like that, um, it means that some other things that are outside there, or you can put it as other, starting with the highest frequency, and then you say other at the at the end. You otherwise you might miss out on some things. Yeah. So some things are a bit difficult to ask, but you can always work around it. And if, um, if you want to know about genetics, for example, history of hearing loss in the family, and that's why I said uh, what we the 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 cutoff point we use is fifty years. Have you had a family member who's lost hearing below the age of fifty? And if so, is it a new? Is it within the nuclear family or extended family? So that will give you an example, like what you said about uh, generations and generations of hearing loss and skipping generations. That will come into effect. So if it's a, a nuclear family, you know that that's very um, closely associated. Mm -hmm. I think this is genius what you've done. The questions you've raised are actually very. Some of them are very difficult to to get around. So you really have to think to ask those questions. I'm not sure if that's okay. And the degree of hearing loss. I just wanted to go to the degree of hearing loss, right ear, left ear, brilliant. You've separated them and you've said um, um, moderately severe, severe, and all those things. There is a classification system. However, I would prefer if you are doing this, you actually put the actual hearing thresholds because then you would get, you would get an average, you'd get the mean hearing thresholds instead of categorizing them before. If you want, when you do your analysis, then you can do the categories, but some information is lost if you've already categorized them before, before you start actually inputting, before you do the analysis at the beginning. So I, th I think it's a brilliant point. example. Yeah. yeah. The, the point of this exercise though, is, is for me to exhibit to other people attending that to design, in, in, in the design of your questionnaire, variables, are very important and knowing what you, to, what you want to do with those variables is important. And also the first thing I started off by doing when I created this table was in bold here. These are the topics that I wanted to ask about. Family, um, family history, infection history, autotoxic history, degree. Um, so the, the point I'm trying to get across to you and and it worked for me and, and it's worked for Lefunda who, who knows I know nothing. Um, 
to, uh, who has been able to see here that from this point, you can design your, your um, questionnaire much better and you're going to get an understanding of how you're going to carry on with your variables. I see there are some questions in the chat. I'm not, okay. Um, do we have to perform analyses in order to determine whether data is normally distributed or not? Well, I think that is part of your analysis. You have to have your data and then you have to graph it to see that it's normal or not normal. You, um, I think Richard did answer you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, so Prof Heft has answered your question. Are there any other questions? Uh, this talk will be available. So if you want to go back to see the tool that I provide that you don't need to know, off the top of your head, it's, it's there just to show you that different tests are done for different kinds of variables. That's all there. And there is this, is a, this example that will help you when you are trying to design your study. Richard, would you like to comment on anything? Yeah, no, that's a wonderful talk and I love your spreadsheet. I just wanted to make three points on it that might not be entirely clear that people must think about. The first is there are quite a few yes, no's there. It's absolutely essential that you actually know there are three categories. Yes, no, which means definitely no. I asked and they said no. And then unknown, not known, um, not available, etc., which is quite different from no. So make absolutely sure you don't tick no because the person can't remember ever actually had one or says they have to ask their mother or something that's unknown. And that's a separate issue from yes or no. The second one is you mentioned, for example, collecting a list of medications that might have been ototoxic. If there's a list that you more or less know, then list them one per field and tick them yes or no. What people often do is they write it in one cell, streptomycin, vancomycin, erythromycin, and it's impossible to do statistical analyses when there are three names written in one cell and the one field. So um, if you know that there are only five or six, then give each one its own column and tick you know, yes, no, or unknown for vancomycin, yes, no, or unknown for erythromycin, et cetera. Um, so now that's two, and I actually forget what the third was, um, but those really are the main things. Yeah. Um, there's a question about being mandatory to undertake reliability and val validity. You know, I I, and I think Prof. Hef can come in here. I honestly think it is depends on your study. In many cases, there's an already validated questionnaire that's available, in which case you don't have to go through that. You can say that it's validated as long as it's validated in a, the same context. There's no point in having a questionnaire that has been validated at Harvard University where a question comes across where they're testing the fitness of people with how many rounds of golf do you play every week? And that would mean absolutely nothing to our patients. So as long as it's, it fits in, and so you can use ready validated um, questionnaires. I like to think in a small study, like an MMED study or, or some PhD studies where you're just trying to set the scene, that you would design your questionnaire and trial it. Do a little pilot study, do a pilot study with colleagues, do a pilot study on a few patients, just to see if the answers come out as you think they should, in a useful way, that you can then go back to the drawing table. And for example, as you know, I wrote here, um, the right, it have mild to severe um, hearing loss. If I'd had a round table and sent this questionnaire to Lafunda, he'd have come back and said, no, let's tweak it. Let's use the, something else that's, that's more useful. 
Um, okay, I had said that there was a list of drugs, but Prof Heft has made um, a point that for at least ear infections and autotoxic um, therapeutics, we'd have more than a yes or no. And yes or no might be adequate for family, family history, but it might not be adequate, was probably not adequate for ear infections, et cetera. So just in this session, this little questionnaire that I would be developing has already um, undergone some sort of peer review, which would improve its reliability and validity. If your whole PhD is going to center around one questionnaire, then I would suggest you do do the reliability and validity and then the various methods of that. But it's not always necessary to, to do the full test across. It, it can take an awfully long time and um, you, you, it would be beyond the time that you can do a PhD in. So I hope that answers your question, John. And Richard, if you want to comment any further on that. Yes, I was just typing. Um, reliability and validity obviously applies to all research, but test tube research, for example, or research with patients, you know, I'm measuring things and then usually the reliability and validity is fairly self-evident and it's not um, separately or formally assessed. When you design your own instruments and a thing like a questionnaire is, um, or test that you design is classed as an instrument, then you really have to show that it is true and fair. So just to remind those who don't know, reliability means repeatable. In other words, if you gave your question to people today, and then you went back and gave it to the same people next week, you would get the same results. And they wouldn't all say something different next week. That's reliability. And validity means that it actually measures what it thinks um, it measures. If, for example, you asked people, how much do you drink alcohol? And they all said very little. And then you went and visited them at home on Saturday night and found them putting away the brandy, then your test is actually not valid. Because the fact that it found a result saying does not drink is in fact just not true. So that question is not measuring what it's set out to measure. So that's the difference between reliability and validity. What, what I learned from Venus Ingram is the more formal your questionnaire, the more it's, for example, in a sociological journal or a medical education journal, the more attention you actually have to pay to these formal um, tests of reliability and validity. So always consider that you may have to do it, but we can't make a blanket rule for it. Yeah, especially if you're doing qualitative research and you're going to be using a survey in your in your qualitative research you, and especially if your entire study is going to center around it you, you really must go to those lengths yeah right if they know sorry carry on oh musa no, uh, go ahead go ahead hi thanks uh, uh, for the opportunity so so my question is slightly different because it relates to more the topic than the, the processes you discussed. We looked at um, at uh, the effect of the Dacolin when it was new, I think two years back with the master's student. But what happened is uh, she took so long that some people ended up working in the area and publishing some results that uh, sort of closely matched the topic area we studied. And, and I'm wondering whether it means now we're putting off our our uh, research and findings, or is there a way of critiquing the, the the previous research? Because unfortunately, it's still in South Africa, and there's, there's, I don't think there's any unique uh, contextual uh, issues that maybe we can bring up. But I I do want to use up the 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 results because they really were uh, I guess. Uh, of quality. It's just I don't know whether they add any value if in the presence of another study that sort of looked at uh, similar con uh, ideas. 
Okay, I, I, I didn't quite hear, but what I, I think you are asking is you started a study and in the meantime, somebody has published the same kind of study and you wanting to know whether you should continue with your study. Am I right? Uh, not not to continue, but to write a process and, 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 and write up the, the results. Uh, especially towards the paper, would that be something they, 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 that any paper, any journal would consider? Or, or they'll ask the same thing I'm asking myself about whether or not there's anything new that the study is bringing up relative to the one that was done. Well, if there's absolutely nothing new and you, you are certain about that, then if it's for an MMED study, the data can still be written up as a thesis because it's unlikely that a journal will pick it up for publication. However, in science, repeatability is very important. So it actually does help people when they see that two or three people have done the same kind of study coming up with the same results. So, I would be less pessimistic about um, trying to publish it. If I wouldn't publish it in the same journal, maybe, but if it's a completely different setting, you had different variables that you looked at, I don't think you should throw the, the research away. Um, another thing is, are you sure? I mean, if you did this study in Uppington and you do a study at Nguilizana, same country, you might be looking at a completely different context and you can highlight the difference in the context. So um, you must be very sure that there's absolutely nothing novel in your study before you decide not to publish. Richard, would you like to expand on that? Not really. Um, as, as you said, the purists would say in science that, of course, repeated studies should be published. That's how we check whether things are true or not. Mm. But in practice, yes, and journals will often sadly go for originality. Um, yeah. But I would certainly, you know, write it well, stress anything that is uh, different to what's known already, provided it's believable, you know, and try to publish it. Yeah, yeah. I hope that helps you. Thank you so much. Uh, it does yeah. help a bit. Thank you so much. Good. Okay, we passed half past four. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I think next week, Prof. Heft is up again, um, looking at more stats. And then remember, in June, we are looking at academic writing for the entire month. So thanks, everybody, for attending. And we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye, Prof. Thank you. Bye.